And I might have just come from Davos Economic Forum, not a place where you would expect to find Buddhist monks. But the point is, is that unless we bring a more altruistic society, this is no more a luxury, this is absolute necessity. So, how to do that? No, there is the, the point is to find the connection between the individual transformation and cultural change. That's really the challenge. So, um, somehow it has to start with individual changing you know society the building blocks of society are made of individuals and then it has to expand in some way to individual contagion to change of ideas to cultural shift to evolution of cultures so that it's not just someone in this little bubble trying to become more altruistic and that's it in a way that's the heart of uh, meditation as i, I understand it because it's also linked with an understanding of reality, the understanding of interdependence, and how, in a way, if you pull in a spider web, if you pull a little bit something in the corner, the whole thing sort of changes. So we do contribute to, the, to, to that change. So now, taking that in mind, that the interconnection between the individual change and society change, uh, when it comes to actual meditation, uh, most people d don't think meditation is anything necessary in life. And it has to do with, m for many reasons, it has to do with the word itself that's somehow associated with oriental and sort of exotic sort of perceptions. And um, also the idea, you know, why should I take out 20 precious minutes of my life to, to just look at my nav navel and sort of they get lost in my thoughts when I could do something useful or at least what I need to do and have to do. So, in a way, there is a c also there's a lot of cliches about meditation. You know, meditation, that means you need to blank out your mind and relax. So that's kind of assimilated to a nice uh, sort of you know, relaxation session where you get off a little bit of your stress and then start all over again. So I think there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding. So I re really the question would should be, why should we bother? What's the point of even doing something remotely looking like meditation? And so knowing that meditation is about training the mind, changing your way you experience the, the outer circumstances of the world and your inner world as of emotions and so forth. Why should we bother? I've read an article in, in the scientific journal Nature of someone arguing that those things are utterly unnecessary Evolution has brought us to a certain point where we learn enough, more than enough things by just interacting with the world from the moment we are born. That's all we need. Every other stuff is totally artificial. Well, we could say to that, you are not born uh, knowing how to read and write, to ride a bicycle, to play chess, to play tennis and play Mozart. That's clear. There have been a huge amount of training, effort, sustained discipline in acquiring those skills. Now, we absolutely agree on that. Nobody minds, even we don't always appreciate it, to go to school for a number of years, to have a professional training, and if we are interested in playing a musical instrument or becoming an athlete, to spend the necessary effort for it. We do that because we see ahead the potential benefit for it, for our health, for our pleasure, for our flourishing, and therefore we see this is worth doing. It's kind of strange that we assume that basic human qualities like peace of mind, loving kindness, compassion, resilience, emotional balance, that they will be at the optimal state just like that, because we wish it so. They will be sort of the normal state, like someone who has never trained doing the piano, who has never run systematically so that they could eventually run a marathon. Yes, we know how to work, we can run a little bit, but this is far from expressing the whole potential we have. Maybe it's 10% of that potential. 
So would it be true exactly the same for the mind? And possibly one of our drama is that we vastly underestimate the power of transformation of the mind or actualizing another 90% of that potential. So why should we bother? I think the first question is, what is our present state in our life? Can we say? I met someone who told me, you know, I would not change anything in my life. Everything is absolutely fine. I'm totally enjoying it. Maybe. But is it really honestly true? Is there anything? <laughs> I mean, how can we say that there's not something that we could, could be more optimal? Uh, that so-called normal state is, of course, shared by all, but maybe it's a kind of pandemic. And normal is doesn't mean, doesn't mean optimal. So is there nothing that we feel that we could improve? We could be more compassionate, uh, have a little more peace of mind. So some of the arguments sometimes it's put is said, well, you know, that's what makes me a, a, a special individual. I'm different from someone else. It's the richness of life to have sometimes terrible crisis of jealousy or something. We don't, that will be boring. We'll all be the same. You know, Goethe wrote that three days of uninterrupted happiness will be unbearable. It's always the same. And suffering is, you know, this intensity of always changing is f so colorful. But no, I think that's a very s bit of a spacious argument. So honestly, nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, may I suffer the whole day or possibly my whole life. We aspire to be free from suffering, to find some happiness. There are outer and inner conditions to that. There are outer conditions we hope to improve them as much as possible. But if we ignore the way our mind experiences that, the way our mind translates the outer condition in happiness or misery, we know the fact that our state of mind can very easily eclipse the outer condition. We can be miserable in seemingly uh, perfect paradise. We can have strength of mind, joy of being alive, even the conditions are, seems to be difficult. We know all that. And yet, that sort of spoiled bright of the mind, we just do basically nothing to improve the way it functions. So honestly, I think it, it seems that it is desirable to develop certain skills and certain quality that we do have the potential for. Now, the real question is, is it possible or not? It might be so much that our traits are so ingrained in, you know, to influence of genetics, of the experience of our early life, of the circumstances that constrain our way of life, that there's very little margin for changing. And maybe, you know, things like uh, nagging jealousy or obsession or spontaneous anger are so much in the fabric of what you call human nature or human mind that to get rid of those or to those afflictive parts will be like trying to destroy part of ourselves, and that will not work. So that's a real question. So first of all, I think the idea is, yes, those are part of human nature. We all know what, is, what jealousy is. We all know what anger and irritation and arrogance and uh, obsessive desire can be. But you need, there's many ways to be part of something. You could be part of something intrinsically, like maybe the, the red dye of this cloth, and then to get rid of it, possibly have to destroy. Or if you take a glass of water, Anyway, imagine there's water in this, in this glass. H2O, I could put some cyanide, and if I drink it, that's the end of the conference. <laughs> or there could be medicine, and it is medicinal water. But H2O didn't change. It didn't become poisonous, didn't become medicinal. It's not changed. So what about the mind? Are those mental factors of anger, jealousy, and so forth, mental construct that comes to many causes and conditions and circumstances? But at which level are they intrinsic or not to our basic experience? And I think here, the contemplative approach can help us solve that problem. If you think of any mental event, whether it's an emotion, a reasoning, a memory, imagination of the future, there is something that is the most common denominator. It's just to be aware, the faculty to know the basic cognitive faculty that's different from this glass that doesn't know anything. It's a zero in terms of cognition. So now if you think of what is cognition, it's a little bit like light that allows you to perceive the whole range of phenomena, outer and inner phenomena. But 
what is the quality required of light to be to do so? It is not modified by what it lights up. Otherwise, you know, if light was making dirty everything it shines upon, everything will appear as dirty. But if you shine a torchlight on a heap of garbage, it doesn't become dirty. If you shine it on a heap of gold, it doesn't become expensive or precious or whatever. It reveals it. So the basic cognitive faculty, the most fundamental aspect of consciousness, of awareness, is to precisely allow everything else. But that itself, no more than H2O is corrupted by poison or enhanced by medicine, this is just the most fundamental aspect of consciousness. To give a last quick example, a mirror. Why is a mirror something, a, a kind of nice special object? Because it can reflect infinite number of faces and things like that. Now imagine that each face would belong to the mirror, stick to the mirror, paint the mirror. After a few faces, you will have to throw the mirror and get a new one. It will be full of you know, angry face, smiling face, it's useless. So the face reflects, but it's not part of the mirror, it doesn't stay. The, the mirror allows that. So likewise, from a contemplative perspective, if you look deep within, behind the screen of thought, there is this luminous primal quality of consciousness that is undetermined. That's the foundation for trusting that you could modify the various causes and conditions that brings about mental construct, emotions, and so forth. So that's the fundamental notion of mind training, potential for it. Now, then what will be the subject of training? It will be to transform the way we experience things, not to be the slave of our constant chain of thoughts, rumination, hopes and fears, endless. When people sit for the first time to meditate, sometimes they say, oh, I have so much thought. Then when I don't meditate, basically they just become aware of the extent of the catastrophe. We have thoughts spinning from morning till evening nonstop, and we have very little, we just you know, follow after them and swayed by them endlessly without the slightest control. Now when we dis bring this idea of controlling the mind, people say, oh, no, no, it's like putting the mind in shackles. I don't want that, I want to be free. But what does freedom mean? To do anything that comes through your mind? That doesn't look like freedom to me. It seems more to be the slave of every thought. Now, to give an image that might help, suppose you are a sailor at sea and you want to go somewhere. So if freedom is to do anything that comes spont spontaneously, then freedom would mean let the boat drift wherever the wind and the current blows. That's freedom, isn't it? But isn't it taking the helms, rigging the sails, and navigating where you want to go the real freedom of want at going where you decided to go. That means being in charge of the boat, being master of the boat. So true mastery of the mind is freedom of the mind. Otherwise, you are a slave by your thoughts. That being sort of uh, said, then how do you achieve that? Well, first of all, as you we notice when we begin to meditate, the mind is really like a restless monkey. Now imagine a restless monkey that is tied up with tens or 12 ropes, and uh, you want to free that monkey, or the monkey hopes to be free, but it jumps so much that you can't even undie one single note. So how to help? You have to calm the monkey, not by knocking the monkey off on his head, but let it rest a little bit so that you can untie the knots bit by bit and gain freedom. So that's, that's why as the initial tool of meditation, whatever you want to cultivate later on, whether it's compassion, you know, emotional balance, or dealing with your emotions, you need to have this relative calmness and stableness and clarity of mind as a, as a necessary tool. So it's not just emptying your mind, it's not going to work, thoughts are there anyway, what can you start to block them when they're already there? But it's really at least a relative inner calm, more clarity, more stability, so that you can use that to then cultivate something like loving kindness. And actually, the words, uh, the Eastern word, like bhavana in Sanskrit or gom in Tibetan, that are usually translated as meditation, really do mean to become familiar with something, familiar with a new way of being, familiar with a new skill, like loving kindness, familiar with the basic understanding of how the mind works, and to cultivate those qualities. So there's a process. So 
if the basis has to have at least a flexible tool, there are basic techniques to achieve that. Uh, based on attention, increasing your mindfulness of moment to moment. And so it, there's many ways in the, in the Buddhist realm. There are other traditions also teaching mindfulness and vigilance and being in the present moment. But one very simple one is to take a support of attention uh, that is subtle enough that you will notice if you are distracted. If you say, I'm going to concentrate on a flashing red light, you, know, you could still sort of notice it, but while your mind is wandering because it's so obvious. Imagine now that you are trying to concentrate on the coming and going of your breath. It's something automatic that normally we don't pay attention to. Now, if you start to add, pay attention to the feeling of, say, of the air coming out of the nostril and then the breath coming out and then it stops and then you're coming in or the movement of your belly or your lungs, there's a sensation uh, related to that and you can place your mind upon that sensation and just try to be mindful of noticing the breath is coming out, the breath is coming in. That looks very simple, but if you distract it, then that's all gone. It's not like a flashing light. So you can easily sort of check whether your mind is there or not. So when you, no when you notice you have been distracted, you just bring it back. So this using a natural process that's always with you is a useful tool to increase this faculty of mindfulness to what's happening now. It could be done the same with sensations, whatever you feel in your body, sensation of heat and cold, of pain or comfort. It could be with a different thing you hear, that the, the noise of this projector or something. M provided you are mindful of it in the present moment, that's your mindfulness. You are not just constantly distracted. So once we have uh, achieved some skill on that, then we can use that to then cultivate other quality that we deem worth cultivating, like loving kindness, or how, how to deal better with the arising of, of afflictive and disturbing emotions. So take the example of loving kindness. We all have feelings from time to time of unconditional love for someone. Usually it lasts a certain time, maybe 10, 15 seconds, and then soon some other thoughts come in and out. So we don't sit with that for 20 minutes. That doesn't happen as we run on the bicycle in our flat to, to 20 minutes of exercise. So what about instead of those 15 seconds is we were purposely bringing in the mind a feeling of unconditional love for someone from whom we have no difficulty to feel so, whether it's our child or someone very dear. And when this feeling is very vivid, both uh, cognitively and emotionally, then we just keep on nurturing it for a while, not just a few seconds, but maybe 10 minutes, maybe more. When it starts to decline a little bit or to become a little bit more vague or more distracted, we just revive it, nurture it, sustain it. Now, if you do that for 20 minutes, that would make a difference. It's completely different than doing it for 15 seconds. In the same way that playing the piano for 20 minutes is a different result than playing it for a minute. So both from the experiential side, to do that regularly will bring a true lasting change after a while. And from the neuroscience, today we are not going to go too much on that side, but the notion of brain plasticity, neuroplasticity, is that when you are exposed regularly for a certain time to novelty, something new that you are not doing before or not experiencing before, that what is going to bring lasting change in the brain function. And after a month, you can always see a difference. You can see difference in the brain, you can see difference in the level of stress, you can see difference in your immune system. So today I'm not going to speak about that, but both the brain function and the, even the health and the immune system will be changed. But that requires perseverance. Just like if you want your apartment plants to grow nicely, you are going to put a little water every day, not just a bucket once a month. So regularity and some duration is what makes the difference. So it might be considered as boring, but what does that mean? It's a process of learning. So that is to do with cultivating qualities. 
Now, how can we then use that skill to improve the quality of every moment that we live? So let's take examples of what often undermined this experience of well-being or happiness or flourishing. Usually it's the destructive emotions. You are swayed by anger or nagged by jealousy or you know, anxiety is filling up your mind. So you feel you are quite powerless uh, about those states of mind. Uh, you would rather do without it. You know, if we had said today, we'll spend two hours cultivating jealousy, I'm not sure you would have joined. Now, if you speak of cultivating loving kindness, it seems more appealing, isn't it? Whole weekend on jealousy, so what? So even though we say, well, that's human nature, that's the richness of our you know, array of emotions, yet somehow we would not like to be always under the sway of jealousy. So now, but when they come, we're sort of powerlessly you know, taken by that. It fills our mind. We are one with jealousy or one with anxiety. So how can we proceed? How the meditative experience can help us to deal better with that? So that's where the notion of awareness and mindfulness comes into picture. Even you are taken by quite some preoccupation which makes you anxious. The mind at always has the faculty to be aware of it, to watch that. This is an innate faculty of the mind. No matter what, if you just step a little bit and look at you can look at your, with the eye of the mind, of course, you can look at your experience as someone will watch a fire th that burns. If you think of that, what is aware of anger is not angry, it's aware. What is aware of anxiety is not anxious, it's aware. So it is not actually tainted by anxiety or anger. So now, you, instead of being anger all over the place, you have anger and a space of mindfulness. And if you persevere doing so, what naturally happens, that's a matter of experience, is the more you maintain that awareness of the off or the anger or the anxiety has a tendency to melt down. It's just like if you stop adding wood to a fire, it will burn, but not for very long. So naturally, it will, win, it will vanish away. Doing so, you avoid the two sort of pitfalls. One is to try just to suppress it. Suppressing means keeping it intact somewhere, like a time bomb. This doesn't do any good. It's the causes are not being remedied. The thing is still there. Or you blow it away, like if it's anger. That also doesn't help very much. Not for you, not for others. And all studies show that it just increases your tendency to anger. But now you have dealt in an intelligent way. The, thing, the emotion came up. Just watch it with mindfulness, it, it vanished away. You dealt suc successfully with that episode, and by doing so repeatedly, you build up a capacity so that you are less vulnerable to that. That means it will take more for you to be submerged by anxiety, so it will eventually come less often, less strong, and you can imagine a time where simply like things like hatred are just no more part of your mental landscape. And that's the result of a process of familiarization. So that is a true sign of transformation, not some mystical, sudden meditative experiences that might be like nice fireworks, but doesn't result into deep change. So th this baseline of your understanding of happiness and suffering, of your way you react to emotions, that will be changed by time. So it seems uh, it's worth. Now, people will say, well, you know, we don't have time. I always find this a little bit strange uh, to say that. And, and <laughs> it's like you say you go to a doctor and the doctor said, look, you know, yeah, your condition is not so good. I, I would advise that you do this and that uh, because you are stressed and you are something really wrong with you. And please do this treatment. And you say, no, doctor, you know, I can't do that now. First, I, I feel quite weak and I'm quite stressed and I don't have any time. So I'll do all that when I'm, I, I'm healthy again and everything is fine. Uh, of course, you need the treatment when you need it. So in a way, if something like 20 minutes a day uh, of learning how to reach this more optimal state of mind, 
that give you the resources to deal with everything else, the, the ups and downs of life. Uh, modify the quality of the 23 hours and 30 minutes that left, including your sleep sometime. It seems a worthy way of spending time. That's why we do exercise, fitness. We know how the benefit for health. So that's the sort of foundation ideas of, of mind training or meditation. And you can apply that to emotional awareness, the way to deal with emotion, developing attention, uh, developing emotional balance, uh, more inner strength, and uh, you know, the faculty to recognize emotion as they arise, to deal with them in an in, in a intelligent way, so that they sort of undo themselves as they arise and not overwhelm you. So all this, little by little, dealing with pain, physical pain and others, uh, will definitely lead with a healthier state of mind, a, a more balanced state of mind. And so it seems that uh, possibly one of our drama of our times is to vastly underestimate the power of transformation of mind. So that's, uh, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what meditation can be, and it's just to, in a way, demystify it without making a, a, a sort of meditation light version, but seeing that is something that really uh, is concerned because we all have a mind, and we will have to deal with that small bright of the mind, and the result is really a state of uh, a baseline of relative happiness or constant misery. So it's at the heart of the quality of our experience and also at the heart of the quality of how we'll relate to others. I mean, if you're overly preoccupied and vulnerable, tendency is to withdraw in the bubble of ego and say, I have to take care of that. If you have this increased sense of confidence and less vulnerability, you're not going to become indifferent. You're going to be fully ready, actually, to open to others because you don't feel under threat. You don't feel this vulnerability. So in a way, altruism and compassion goes with some kind of fearlessness, and that fearlessness does come from knowing that, well, basically, no matter what, you're going to be fine, and fine inwardly. But then, you, know, you can help the world, and you can be at the service of others in a much better way.